Good evening. Welcome behind the scenes of major criminal investigations and to your chance to help to solve them. Here's the number, 081-811-8181. And here are the detectives who need your help. They're waiting for your call. Tonight's cases include the murder of a woman in County Durham as she sunbathed in her garden in the height of the summer. A young police constable was shot in the leg as four men raided a security van at gunpoint in a quiet shopping street in Kent. And on a coast-to-coast -coast hike between the Lake District and North Yorkshire, Jo Chandler was violently attacked. She's still seriously ill in hospital. Our first case is one that's already made national headlines. The murder of Anne Heron on the hottest day of the year. It was a Friday afternoon, Friday, August the 3rd, and temperatures almost touched 100 Fahrenheit, which means you might remember it. Where were you? The crime was committed in County Durham, though, as you'll see, the killer could have come from anywhere in Britain. This is the market town of Darlington, and even early that Friday morning, the heat was becoming quite oppressive. At some time after 10, Anne Heron went shopping in the town with her friend Dawn Perry. I've known Anne for two years now and became very good friends. She was a very loving person. You know, she would do anything for anybody. You know, she had a heart of gold. She was just, she was just a girl in a million. We were going to a party on the 3rd of August and she was really looking forward to having a good night out with all the girls, you know, a real good get together. Anne's home, Aeolian House, is a conspicuous building a mile from Darlington on the A67 towards Middleton St George. Anne was a Glaswegian who'd moved down here to County Durham when she met her husband ten years ago. She loved the place, but she was frightened of its isolation and was wary of being alone in the house. Her friends say she was happy and bubbly with those she knew, but they describe her as rather private and a modest woman. What a scorcher today, a wonderful Costa del sunny Friday afternoon in Cleveland, North Yorkshire and South Durham. 95, 95, 95. Her husband, Peter, whose office is just down the road, always came home for lunch. Hello, Princess. How are you? I'm OK. It wasn't so hot. This being sent home for yesterday's strike. Britain's hottest day, the temperature heads for 98 degrees. Renewed fighting has broken out in Kuwait as Iraqi troops... Ah, great, great. Yesterday, eight American oil workers are reported... You're not having anything? No, I had something at McDonald's while I was out shopping. This morning, Did you buy anything? Hotel. Just a birthday present for Diane. And what are you doing this afternoon? I thought I might do a couple of hours sunbathing. Didn't get a chance this morning. At two o'clock, Peter went back to work. We're off to an exhibition of old and rare musical instruments shortly. Up to Judy Zook and a new version of an old song. I've been trying to get hold of you all week. Listen, I can't give you a lift to the party tonight. I'm really sorry. But the car's full up and I've no spare seats. A friend, Sheila Eagle, is the last person known to have spoken oh, to Anne. Really it's now 2.30. Don't worry, it's all right. Oh, OK. What are you up to this afternoon? I was going to sit in the garden and top up my tan. Oh, you'll end up looking like a wizened old prune. Oh, <laughs> you're just jealous. See you tonight, Anne. Bye. Just before 3.30, Margaret Shaw saw Anne sunbathing close to the house. This is the last known sighting of Anne. At about a quarter to five, a blue car, possibly an Astra, was seen outside Anne's house. And later, it's thought there was a blue Sherpa van parked at the end of the drive with three men in it. 
Just after five, a taxi passed the house and the passenger saw someone running down the road. She thought it odd that a man was running so fast and despite the heat, was in long trousers. He ran off towards Middleton St George. At about the same time, a taxi driver noticed a car speeding down the drive away from the house. He wasn't sure if it was going to stop. He came out behind me and accelerated very, very fast, passed me straight. And as he passed me, I, I, I looked over and got a, a split-second glimpse of him, and he accelerated past over the roundabout, heading towards Darling. Just before 6 p.m., Peter Heron came home. Unusually, Anne was not there to meet him and the front door was wide open. He found Anne's body in the living room. Her throat had been cut with something like a standing knife. Mr Edmund, was it someone she knew? Do you know? It's quite probable that she did know her killer, yes. There were no signs of a struggle either inside the house or outside of the house. So presumably you need to know everyone who, who knew Anne, anyone at all? We certainly do. We need to know anyone who we haven't contacted already who knew Anne. There are clearly a lot of people we saw from that film that need to be eliminated. The jogger, for example, probably nothing to do with the crime, but could be a critical witness. That's correct. He could be absolutely vital to us. He's probably a local man who was passing the house at about the right time and for some reason hasn't come forward. I would certainly appeal to him to come forward and speak to us, even at this late stage. And then that car, so many people saw the car, one car speeding, one car parked outside a house, possibly the same, same one, even though seen by lots of different people. That's probably right. We do think it is, in fact, the same car that was parked at the house and came down the drive, and it's vital that we, in fact, trace the owner of that vehicle. That's obviously the most interesting of, of the sightings coming so fast out of the house, and it's probable, again, that the van that was parked at the end is something you need to eliminate, isn't it? That's, that's correct, yes. The three men who were with that van parked at the end of the drive are essential witnesses and we would urge them there aren't many vehicles with such a sign as that on the side it's a trident logo horse I mean, we, we think that that's it from people's recollection it's that's something it. like that yes and of course a lot of other people will have been going on this road it's a, it's a main road isn't it out of Darlington to, to Teesside Airport that's right the year 67 is the main route from Darlington to Teesside Airport and it's a very busy road we need to speak to anyone who used that road that Friday afternoon. They could be essential witnesses. They may have seen something that we haven't found out yet. OK, well, if you think you were driving then, the date is the 3rd of August, Friday the 3rd. Check your diary if you've got one. And if you can help in any way, or if you knew Anne, here's the number, 081 811 8181. Or you can call the incident room at Durham Police Headquarters. That's 091 386 4929. 091 386 4929. Well, now, following our programme last month, two people are in custody, both as a result of photocall. A man who tried to rob a bank in south-east London but was foiled by the security system was identified by several viewers. He's now in custody and awaiting formal charge. And detectives in Southampton investigating a serious fraud received a call from somebody who recognised a photocall face as a salesman at a garage in St Austell in Cornwall. The day after the programme, a man was arrested. He's now been charged with six offences, including two of obtaining money by deception. On the murder of Lee Parsons, the masseurs from North London, two separate callers provided police with a motive and with names, and their information ties in with other lines of the inquiry. Now, please, if you made either of those calls, clearly you want to help, please do call again. Please think there's something else you can help them with, and they say your anonymity will be respected. No fewer than 302 people called about the sex attacks on two young boys in Litham. There's so much information, police are still working through it. But in the process, they've already cleared up five serious offences of indecency with children. And some crucial witnesses came forward after seeing the reconstruction about Mrs Trevelyn Evans, the shopkeeper who vanished from Llangollen. Two women rang from Scotland to say they'd seen her in a wine bar with a grey-haired man. And a couple from Bradford, who'd been in her shop just before she disappeared, they saw her having what they describe as an intense conversation with a grey-haired man. Now, if you saw a man like this, smartly dressed, in Langochland, any time in mid-June, do call this number, 0978 290 222. That's 0978, the code for Wrexham.
290-222. And finally, back to last month's photo call. You may remember we showed some snaps of people on a skiing holiday. Detectives had developed the film from a camera found at the scene of a burglary in Guildford. The people in the pictures recognised themselves and contacted the police. Their camera had been stolen in a previous burglary, so now the innocent skiers have had the camera returned to them. Well, out of this month's photo call, another gallery of people detectives here would dearly like to interview. If there's anyone you recognise, do call. To take us through the pictures, here are DC Jackie Hames and Superintendent David Hatcher. First, Avon and Somerset Police are keen to find this man, seen here robbing the Bristol and West Building Society in Sea Mills, Bristol, on the morning of the 4th of July this year. Following a successful public appeal, we need to find a man who calls himself Christopher Richardson. He's since travelled to Clacton-on-Sea, Essex, where he was last seen in August. He's also been living in Swindon and may have originally come from London's East End. He might well be using a different name by now. If you've seen him or indeed know his present identity, please let us know. Terence Caulfield could be anywhere in the country and Essex police would very much like to talk to him. He's known to some as Morris Fitzpatrick and may have information about an £80,000 fraud inquiry. A house here at Corf Castle, Dorset is the subject of an investigation following a complaint from a 64-year-old Chelmsford lady. She says she handed over her late husband's inheritance in the belief that she was buying it. She claims she was given the keys to the house, but once she'd packed up all her belongings, the removal van never turned up. Terence Caulfield is about six foot and heavily built and sometimes shaves off that beard. He's a native of Dorset, but he does travel the country via British Rail, staying at hotels and guest houses on the way. If you've seen him recently, please call us now. We'd like your help to trace this man, Bradley Milton Witcherley, in connection with a robbery in the Channel Islands. It happened in Jersey on Monday the 4th of June at St Peter's Village. A man went into the sub-post office at about half past three in the afternoon and stole six and a half thousand pounds from the safe. He was disturbed by the postmistress, who he hit in the stomach as he ran away. She was six months pregnant. He made his getaway in this black Ford XR3i convertible, which had been hired from a local company. Bradley Witcherly is 26. He's 5 foot 11 inches tall, with medium build, and has brown wavy hair and brown eyes. He comes from Liverpool, but is known to travel extensively in Europe and in the UK. He may have recently been in Blackpool or London. If you think you know where he is now, please call us. Next, these three men caused such confusion in the Building Society in Ledbury, Herefordshire, that they managed to steal travellers' cheques worth over £4,000. The cheques were, however, stopped immediately and later attempts to ca cash them failed. This man is 30 to 35 years old, 5 foot 10, slim build with short cropped dark hair. He came in at 11am on Thursday the 28th of June. The second man is 35, 5 foot 11, stocky build with short hair. And the third man is 25 to 30, 5 foot 8 of medium build with short, very dark brown hair. Colleagues at West Mercia believe they could be part of a countrywide team operating throughout the UK since the beginning of the year. So if you think you know who they are or you recognise any of our other photo call faces, please call us now. Here's the number 081 811 8181. 081 811 8181. In our next case, a young off-duty police constable was shot in the leg, the bullet narrowly missing an artery as he intervened in an armed raid on a security van in a quiet shopping street in the town of Tankerton in Kent. It was lunchtime on Tuesday the 4th of September, the day that many children around the country went back to school after the summer break. Do you remember seeing something unusual, either at the scene of the robbery or at the nearby sewage works, which were to play a vital part in what happened? Our reconstruction begins four miles away from Tankerton, three days before the robbery, with the theft of a water authority's van at Hearn Bay. Inside were the keys to all Southern Water Authority premises, including the sewage works at Tankerton. Three days later, on the morning of the robbery, Tuesday the 4th of September, Two water authority workers arrived at the sewage works for routine maintenance checks to find that the padlocks had been changed. A mobile generator had been taken out of the garage. Inside, everything had been cleared away, but several empty nylon sacks had been put there. The men locked up and left. 
It's 10 to 12. Just round the corner in Hearn Bay Road, an agitated man called in at this general store. Excuse me, I'm looking for the old waterboard sign. I'm sorry, we've just moved here. Yeah, I was driven down on the dark once. I can't quite remember where it is. I'm looking for the Essex waterboard. No, sorry, the Kent. You might mean the old sewage work site. It's on the right over there, just round the corner. Just down here? Maybe. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. 20 past one, a quiet Tuesday lunchtime in Tankerton Road. Securicor were about to make a delivery to Lloyd's Bank. Two men are waiting. A motorist pulling out to pass the van saw a man run up to the driver's door and point a gun at the window. A second man threatened the other guard. Get back in the van. Don't be at fault. Get back in the van. At that moment, PC Eric Tanner came out of the bank with his girlfriend, Michelle. I'm a police officer. Leave him alone! Leave him alone! Back off, Michelle! Get off him! Get off him! Leave him alone! Michelle, back off! Eric Tanner had been shot in the thigh. Get on the ambulance! I was mainly concentrating on the pistol that he had in his hand, because uh, at one time I had hold of his right hand and my left hand had hold of the pistol. And I was actually looking at the pistol and I, I thought personally that it was not a real pistol. The gun was pointing at the back of Eric's head and I was hysterical. I thought he was going to kill him. Um, I started screaming at Eric to let him go, which he didn't. Seconds after the robbery, a witness driving along Tankerton seafront had to brake sharply as a Securicor van, closely followed by a red Austin Maestro, shot out in front of him. The speed at which they were travelling made him suspicious, and he decided to follow them. His suspicions were confirmed when the van and the maestro took a turning through a housing estate heading towards the sewage works. He made a point of getting a good look at the maestro driver. Get a move on! They changed the locks! Just beyond the sewage works is the seafront. A man taking a lunchtime stroll saw a white minibus reverse onto the grass embankment. It's less than 10 minutes since the robbery took place. The minibus was found abandoned four miles away later that afternoon, behind the Tesco Superstore in Whitstable. Shoppers may well have noticed four men carrying heavy bags. The money they took weighed approximately 10 stone. P. 
PC Tanner hopes he'll be back at work in the new year. I uh, have recently been to the physiotherapist and they think I should be getting back on the road now and well, I can put some weight on my leg. So I'm, I'm not too bad. The thought that Eric could have been killed, seeing that gun pointing at his head, is what has frightened me since then. Um, and I think probably that's why I've been more upset by it than Eric has, because he was never really aware that his life was in danger to the degree that I was. Well, Mr Taylor, there were four men involved in the robbery and you have three good video fits. Yes, we have very good video fits of three of the offenders and I'm sure that they're identifiable. Right, well, let's have a look at them again. Um, first of all, the agitated man who asked for directions to the sewage works. Can we have his description? Yes, he, he fits very closely to the description of the man who actually shot PC Tanner. And he's described as being in his mid-30s, six foot four inches tall. And he's a big man, muscular, not fat, and, but described as about 17 stone with dark or brown wavy hair. Now, that's the man on the left-hand side of the screen. In the middle of the screen is the second man, the one driving the red maestro, which closely followed the security call van. What's his description? A smaller man and older. He's per perhaps about 40 years of age. Uh, dark hair with, uh, with his moustache. Um, the most distinguishing feature about him is that he's got narrow eyes and he's of Mediterranean appearance, a swarthy appearance. And then the third man, the one who drove the Securico van on the right-hand side of the picture. Yes, he's uh, again a man in his mid-thirties, six foot to six foot two tall. He's got brown to uh, mousy coloured hair, perhaps greying, and I think it's uh, probably a bit lighter than is shown in the video fit. Right. I, I think that it's worth saying that if, if you view, view all three of these together, uh, somebody may recognise them, and if they do, I would urge them to call our incident room. Right. And all those three men are between the ages of 30 and 40? Yes, that's right. At the beginning of the film, we saw a National Rivers Authority van being stolen inside with the keys to the Tankerton sewage works. That's not f so far been found? No, it hasn't. I'm, I'm convinced that that was involved in the robbery. The keys fitted the barrier to the promenade where the white van was driven from. And I feel that that vehicle has probably been abandoned somewhere, perhaps with false plates, and we'd very much like to find that. Right. Tankerton is a small seaside town and Tankerton Road is a very quiet shopping street. But do you think there may be witnesses who have not yet come forward to the robbery? Yes, that's quite possible. A lot of people have come forward. Uh, we would urge anyone who, who hasn't, who has information about the robbery, to come forward. But I would also like to hear from anyone who was in the area at the time, just so that we could eliminate them from the inquiry. Right. And once again, the date was Tuesday the 4th of September, the day that many schoolchildren went back to school. That's correct. Do you think these men were locals? One of them didn't know the way to the sewage work, so he presumably wasn't. No, Tankerton's a, a fairly quiet seaside town. I would think they're certainly out of town, if not out of the county. Let's have one more look then, finally, at those three men. There is a substantial reward, isn't there, if anybody can recognise these men? Yes, Securico have offered a reward of £25,000 uh, for a successful conviction and the recovery of the money. I think perhaps it's, it's worth mentioning that uh, the size of that reward reflects the seriousness of the offence. These are obviously dangerous men and we need to catch them before they shoot somebody else. All right, Mr Taylor, thank you. If you do recognise any of those three men, either individually or, as Mr Taylor said, you may know them as a group, please do ring. If you think you can help, here's the number here in the studio, 081 811 8181. Or you can phone Mr Taylor's, Taylor's colleagues direct at Kent Police Headquarters on 0622 690909. That's 0622, the code for Maidstone, 690909. Well, now some quick appeals from forces around the country. Here with Instant Desk are Superintendent David Hatcher and Detective Constable Jackie Hames. First, Avon and Somerset Police need your help to find a man who battered and raped a 37-year-old woman on her way to the Glastonbury Festival. The festival began on Friday the 22nd of June. It's crowded, it's noisy, and it's a long way to the stage. Take a few fields in Somerset, fill them with 75,000 people, then you've got the main ingredients for Pilton's Glastonbury Festival, the biggest event of its type in Europe. The victim went to the festival on the last day, Sunday the 24th of June. She wanted to surprise her three daughters who were already there. She arrived early in the evening and on her way into the grounds, she talked to some men in a dark green Ford van. 
She remembers them saying they were going back to London and Tottenham was definitely mentioned. The site covers a massive 500 acres and she didn't know the way to the main entrance. One of the men offered to help her. He walked with her through one of the adjacent fields and there he raped her. He was about 20, had fair mousy hair and a large muscular build. He was clean shaven and wore a sports anorak. He must have been quite noticeable in pink, purple and lime green. Perhaps you remember him at the festival. Or the van itself. The victim noticed could and there were curtains at the window. If you can help in any way, please phone us now. Do you know this man and can you think of any reason why anyone would want to kill him? Brian Adams was shot dead at his home on Tuesday the 14th of August at 11.30pm. He lived alone in this corner house at Thorndyke Avenue, Alverston, Derby. It's on a council estate about half a mile from the main Derby ring road. He was shot by a man in a ski mask as he was parking his motorbike in the back garden. Around the time of the shooting, a dark-coloured Mark IV Cortina was seen parked near his home. This gun is similar to the one that was used to kill him. It's a 12-bore Astra Cyclop or Vanguard shotgun. Derby police are appealing to anyone who owns a similar gun which has gone missing to come forward. Even if you don't have a licence, we won't bring charges. We're only concerned with finding the person responsible for the murder. Remember, that's 11.30 on the 14th of August. At the time of the shooting, you might have been making your way home from three nearby pubs. Were you here at the Alverston Hotel in Derby, known to locals as the Roundhouse? Or were you in the Blue Peter pub? The other pub nearby is the Alverston and Cruton Social Club. Maybe you saw something. Brian Adams was 48 and had his own business called Plant Glass, more recently known as Cab Glass, fitting windscreens to heavy plant machinery. If you knew him through business, or as a friend, and can shed any light at all on why anyone would want to kill him, please phone us now. If you are one of the 500,000 commuters that use the South London railway stations every day, then you may be able to help solve an attempted rape on a young woman in July. We believe her attacker uses the southern network and may visit the embankment and Charing Cross areas of the city. On Saturday the 14th of July, a 22-year-old French student boarded the 7.58 a.m. Charing Cross Dartford train at Platform 6. She thought her carriage was empty, but as the train pulled out of the station, a man appeared beside her and attacked her. To escape him, she left from the moving train as it pulled into Waterloo East. She fell onto the electrified rail and was very lucky not to be killed instantly. Despite terrible injuries, she did manage to climb onto the platform. The train arrived at the adjacent platform and British Rail staff saw her attacker run from the train and through the ticket barrier. He's in his mid to late twenties, about five foot seven and wearing a green shirt. He looks scruffy. Witnesses have been traced who saw this man travelling on two earlier trains that morning. The 6.23 Charing Cross to Hayes and the 7.08 Hayes to Charing Cross. So if you saw him that morning, the 14th of July, or if you recognise him at all, then please call us now. Finally, you could help save part of Britain's heritage. Three masterpieces, perhaps worth hundreds of thousands, were stolen in broad daylight from Lincoln's Inn in the heart of London. A man attacked the warden in the gatehouse, leaving him tied up and unconscious. The thief got into the great hall using the warden's keys and made his way through the basement up to the first floor drawing room where he stripped the old masters from their frames. Two of the paintings stolen were by Thomas Gainsborough. This is a copy of one of them. He's the 18th century judge, Sir John Skinner. The other Gainsborough is of the young William Pitt before he became prime minister. And this portrait is Sir Francis Hargrave by Reynolds. All three have hung in that room for over a hundred years. My London colleagues need your help on several counts. They'd like the young couple who untied the warden to contact them again. They're about 25 and were smartly dressed. If that was you, please call us now. And a brown escort type saloon was seen leaving the area in the direction of Kingsway at about 5.25 p.m. Could you have seen it? And here's the guard's attacker. He's about 30, six foot, medium to stocky build with light brown hair and was wearing a yellow round neck jumper with vertical stripes. If you can help on this or any of our other incident desk cases, please ring us now. And our number once again is 081 811 8181. 081 811 8181.
Just, one, two, just to bring you up to date, we've had almost 40 calls so far on the uh, Anne Heron murder, most of them about the trident symbol that was on the back of the blue van. And all sorts of suggestions being put forward, linking it to the Starkis uh, Hotel Group, uh, the Scottish Hotel Group, to the Maserati Car Company, Sailmakers, Carpet Company, even the Manchester United Football Club. A lot of calls still coming in on that. The other big uh, flow of calls has been on photocall, as always. A number of sightings in particular of Terence Caulfield. And uh, we've, within seconds of the uh, appeal on the Tankerton armed robbery, the yes. reconstruction, there were a number of callers giving names for the three photo fits, and some of those are being actioned right away. Our final appeal this month is on behalf of uh, a woman who tonight is lying seriously ill in a neurosurgical ward of a hospital in Middlesbrough. Can you recall what you were doing on Wednesday the 29th of August? It's the Wednesday after the August bank holiday. If you were anywhere around Catterick in North Yorkshire, you might well recognise something from this reconstruction. And if so, you might help to solve a really quite appalling crime. The attempted murder of a hiker who set out on her own to walk across England from the Lake District to the coast of Yorkshire. These are the North Yorkshire Dales, which form part of one of the most beautiful of hikers' trails in Britain. The coast-to-coast -coast walk stretches from St Bees in Cumbria to Robin Hood's Bay, just north of Scarborough. Joe Chandler, who comes from Gwent, began the walk at Shap on the bank holiday weekend, Saturday the 25th of August. By Tuesday the 28th of August, she'd reached Richmond, about halfway through her journey. That evening, a couple in Swales restaurant noticed Jo was on her own, and so they struck up a conversation. Yes, I... I, I started at Shap on Saturday. Well, won't you join us? There's only three of us here. Oh, really? I, 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 no, I mean, I don't want to interrupt your meal anyway. The place is a set. Joe seemed a bit hesitant about coming over to join us at first, but after a little bit of encouragement, she came over and sat down. Well, and how's the walk going? I've done 60 miles, which is about halfway. I hope to be at Robin Hood's Bay by Sunday. Oh, well done. Oh. My brother's picking me up. If I don't make good progress, I shall cheat and hitch a lift. <laughs> <laughs> I noticed that she had quite a pronounced stammer, and I warmed to her and felt it was a shame she was on her own. But well, we're in Richmond today. Well, we're off to the theatre tonight. Goodbye to America. Yes, that's right. Oh, that funny. I've just bought a ticket too. Good Lord. Oh. Oh, well, perhaps we'll all wander across together. Good night, anyway. Well, after the play had finished, we left the theatre together. But we felt at this point that Joe really wanted to be away from us. Goodbye. Good luck with the walk. And as we walked out together, she walked in the direction of the town, which we later learned was away from the place where she was staying. We don't know where Joe went that evening, but she returned to her guest house and next morning once more set off on her walk. I remember seeing a woman walking down our drive and she was obviously a walker who was going some distance because she was wearing a backpack. But I thought it quite strange that she was on her own. Um, she was obviously lost and didn't know which direction she was going in. Two roads you can get, you either go round the roadway or you can cut through here. We're both making the same track. Okay. Bye. About 15 minutes later, a Dutch hiker who was also doing the walk set off from Richmond in the same direction. This field is used as a car park when Catterick Racecourse has a meeting. The racecourse is just across the road. Was this you practicing your golf swing? It's Wednesday, the 29th of August.
That morning, I uh, took the dog a long walk along the swale, and I, I stopped by the fence to, which overlooks the, the river, looking out for kingfishers. I'd been watching for quite some time and I heard the clang of a gate. I looked up and I saw a woman hiker. But moments later, it seems Joe Chandler was no longer on her own. I was driving the lorry and looking over the hedge, I saw a woman walking on the path near the river. There was a man a pace or so behind her. I assumed there were a couple walking together. The lorry's tachograph shows it was 10.26 a.m. Three quarters of an hour later, the Dutch hiker reached the field. He'd found Jo lying by the river. Her clothing was in disarray and she'd been struck on the head several times with boulders. Jo Chandler had an operation earlier this week to relieve damage on her brain. How is she? She is making a recovery, but uh, it's unlikely she'll be able to help us with the inquiry. Clearly, the best clue you've got is the man who was seen with her in the field, seen by the lorry driver. How good is his description? Obviously, he only got a fleeting glimpse of her. He did. It's a bit vague, but he described him as being uh, shorter than Joe, uh, which would be about five foot eight, medium build, short brown mousy hair. He was wearing light fawn trousers and a pale blue or off-white shirt, which was hanging outside his trousers. Pretty distinctive. Uh... He was five foot eight, roughly, you say, smaller than her. Of course, she was pretty distinctive. She is very distinctive. She's five foot ten, quite tall for a woman. Another lorry driver saw something interesting going on in that field around that time. Yes, he was passing the scene about 15 minutes later, and he saw a man appear from the riverbank who was naked from the waist up, and his clothing appeared to be wet. Now, we've got to bear in mind that the uh, attacker's clothing would be bloodstained, so we think he may have gone in, into the river in an attempt to wash out the blood. So somebody might have gone home wet in that vicinity? Well, there'll be somebody answering that uh, description or in that condition in the locality, yes. Now, you clearly haven't found everyone who was in the locality at the time. For example, that, that golfer. Who do you want to, to get hold of now? Who do you want to contact you? Well, anybody who was in the area between 10 o'clock and 12 o'clock on that Wednesday, the 29th of August, uh, they'd probably be passing through there on the, the way to Reith Show, which was happening locally. Uh, also, there were a number of walkers who have been in the area who we want to trace. There were three walkers just ahead of Joe. There were two other walkers who were just leaving Catrick Bridge uh, and who would have passed the scene about a uh, quarter of an hour later. OK, well, if you were in the area, if you saw Joe, remember she was distinctive, fairly tall. She was wearing those pyjama-type uh, trousers, blue and white stripes. If you were on the coast-to-coast -coast walk, even, towards the end of August, if you can help in any way, please do ring us, 081-811-8181, or you can call the North Allerton Incident Room, that's 0609-789-789, 0609, that's the code for North Allerton, 789-789. Well now, our Aladdin's Cave tonight holds property stolen in burglaries all over the country, some of which happened nearly two years ago, from gold discs to ancient bird cages. See if anything looks familiar to you as Eric Knowles guides us through it. Thank you, Sue. Well, it's rather alarming for me to count the years that have elapsed since I was handed the key of the door. But I would have had some consolation if I'd be given this key. It's in silver, it dates from about 1900. And the interesting thing is that on the terminal, it has the arms of the town of Fenton. Now, that's one of the five towns that make up the pottery towns of Stoke-on-Trent. Talking of pottery, take a look at this splendid vase made by Dalton. Not in the potteries, but down here in Lambeth. The work of Frank Butler, and it shouts Frank Butler to me, that lovely Art Nouveau fronded leaf, a super, super piece. Next to it, a very unusual object, the likes of which I've never seen before. It's a, a Chinese carved hardwood banner. 
Uh, it's full of symbolism, and if we can take at the top, we've got the phoenix, which symbolises the empress, we've got the dragon, which symbolises the emperor, and we've got surrounding three gilt characters, this flock of bats, and they're the symbol of long life. Talking of long life, here's a man that's had a long life in the saddle. It's our friend Lester Piggott. And here he is on, the, on a painting by Jay Sweeney. It's dated 1957, and he's up on Crepello. Well, from a man being on top of a situation to a man who's not very happy being underneath the situation. This is a liqueur stand. It dates from, again, about... This is 1900. Took three decanters, and the umbrella uh, would have taken those little tiny tots. Now, from one extreme to another, uh, for the serious uh, measure, you can't get much bigger than this wonderful silver-plated punch bowl. It actually comes with these two rather unusual plated toddy labels. However, should your <coughs> beverage prove to be tea, then it doesn't come better tasting out of a teapot such as this. Here it is, Georgian silver, about 1800, and it's actually engraved with the initials LMS. Now, that's not London Midland Scottish, it's far too early, as I said, 1900. Now, Russian silver, when it turns up, it's always nice quality. And here's a case that proves my point. It's a cigarette case. And there it is, engraved with a f family of bears in a woodland setting. Now, I'm not a smoker, but I have to say that I would find losing that object somewhat unbearable. But going back to the Orient, look at this for workmanship. Part of a chess set, and this is just the king. The quality on that decoration is fabulous. On a ball, within a ball, within a ball. Quite a super object. And, from one extreme to the other, a very simple object. It's a cat, it's one of a limited edition, very Art Deco in field. He hasn't got a name, but I'm christening him Lucky. I like him. And the number to ring if you recognise anything there, 081 811 8181. 081 811 8181. That's it uh, at the moment. We'll be back at uh, 10 to 12 with uh, more news on calls we've been receiving. That'll be uh, after Dennis Skinner and uh, Edwina Curry have had their say on Question Time. And I don't suppose they ever thought that they'd get uh, a mention on Crime Watch. Uh, meantime, the lines here are going to stay open. Uh, the local numbers for police are on CFAX on page 618. If you know anything that uh, just might help in any of our cases, please do call us. And before we go, a word about those headlines last week, warning of an epidemic of crime that's sweeping across Britain. Do take it with a healthy pinch of salt. The Home Office and the police really are making a rod for their own backs by using statistics that can be hopelessly misleading. The figures don't necessarily mean that crime's gone up but that more crime is being reported to the police, which is obviously quite a different thing. And in fact, we, the public, are getting better at reporting things, especially minor crimes that previously we wouldn't have bothered about. Now, if you really want to know about the real risk of crime, this new publication is much more realistic. It's a survey of people's actual experiences of crime, and it shows how dangerous and scaremongering those headlines are. For example, by international comparisons, our reporting rates for sexual crimes are relatively high. But the percentage of women, according to the survey, who've actually been sexually assaulted in England and Wales is relatively low. In fact, the lowest of any country in the survey. Indeed, for all of us, the actual risks of being hurt because of crime are among the lowest in the world. So don't have nightmares. Do sleep well. Good night. Good night. Welcome back. 
I'm pleased to say we've had an extremely encouraging response to just about all of our appeals tonight, to the point, in fact, where on several of our cases we now have to be quite careful what we say. So I'll just make the comment that there is increased police activity in many parts of the country at this moment. We start with the murder of Anne Heron. Uh, on the hottest day of the year, Anne had been sunbathing in a garden in County Durham. When her husband came home from work, he found her body in the living room. What sort of response have you had? We've had an excellent response, especially with regard to the blue van with the Trident sign. We've had many, many calls about that. We're fairly confident that we should be able to trace this particular vehicle. Now, when I came across earlier, you were particularly engrossed in, in, with one call that you'd got. I was, yes. There was a lady who rang our force control room at 11 o'clock tonight, but before they could get any further information from her, uh, she hung up. Now, why are you so interested in one anonymous call? About a week after the murder, a lady rang a neighbourhood watch scheme contact person in Darlington and asked for the murder incident room. She was very distressed and upset. Before she could give any details, in fact, she hung up. It may just be that this is the same lady who's tried to get in touch with us again tonight. Now, obviously, she wants to help. How can she help if she's frightened of giving her name? She can help very simply by going and picking up the telephone and ringing that number again and giving us the information which she has rather than her name and address. The information is much more important than her name. OK. The telephone number will be on the screens at the end of update. So. Well, photocall usually yields some interesting results. David Hatcher, what news tonight? Christopher Richardson first. Yes, we've had a dozen calls there. Two of them give possible addresses that are being checked out now. One of them is extremely interesting. A 64-year-old lady was defrauded of her inheritance. Police think Terence Caulfield might be able to help with their investigation. Yes, he's also been known as Morris Fitzpatrick. Well, we've had 30 possible sightings of him in various places. A couple of very promising locations mentioned uh, and some addresses are being checked out there. Officers are very excited about that. What about Bradley Witchley, who police would like to talk to about a crime where a six-month pregnant lady was hit in the stomach? Yes, very sad case. You've had some good news. This is bad news. We've only had ten calls, not terribly promising at all. Anybody who knows where Bradley Witchley is now, please call us. We do need to speak to him urgently. Mm. And finally, there are three men whom police would like to talk to about several thousand pounds worth of stolen travellers' cheques. Yes, 18 calls there. Two pairs of people have called and given us two names for two of the, the uh, people involved in that, so that looks very promising too. So we end on good news. Thank you, Dave. Now the uh, tragic case of the hiker, Joe Chandler, who was accosted while on a cross-country walk near Catterick. She was battered on the head with boulders and left for dead beside the River Swale. I'm happy to say she's making something of a recovery. Uh, Robin Cooper, you seem to be more on the phone to your incident room than you were on, on the phone to call us here. What's been the response? We've had about 40 calls into the incident room, um, two calls on the golfer and four uh, suggesting possible suspects. Now, the, the golfer is somebody who might have been a potential witness. You're very keen to, to identify him. What, right. what about the suspects? Are they ones that... Um, are these calls that are rated by your officers? Well, two of the calls are about people who have already in, been in the system. The other two will, will follow up, but uh, you know, I'm, I'm not so sure about those. Now, Jo Chandler was attacked while she was on the coast-to-coast -coast walk, quite a famous walk right across the centre of, of Britain. Who do you want to talk to who was on that walk? I mean, what are the critical dates for anyone who was there? We want to talk to everyone who was on the Coast to Coast walk between the 20th of August and the 4th of September, regardless of whether they've got any information or not. Regardless of whether they knew Joe Chandler, regardless of whether they know anything about this matter? Absolutely. They may be able to assist us. If they were on the walk between those two dates, we would like to hear from them. All right. Once again, the number at the end of the programme. Sue. Well, now the young police constable who was seriously injured when he tried to prevent gunmen from I'm hijacking a, a securical van which was making a delivery in the quiet Kent seaside town of Tankerton. Well, Mr Taylor, what sort of response have you had? Tremendous response. We've had well over 150 calls. Some of those have been from police officers and a large number have given us suggestions as to the identity of the people shown in the video fits. So it looks as though you've got your work cut out for a few yes, days we or weeks. Can we take one final look at those three men? Yes, the three men are, um, are shown on the video. It's the man on the left and the man on the far right, both big men, well over six foot tall, both in their middle 30s. The chap in the middle, a bit older, smaller man, 40 years of age, dark hair, very swarthy complexion, Mediterranean looking. Right, if you think you recognise those three men, either individually or as a group, please give us a ring. Thank you. 
Jackie, what's been happening on the incident yeah. desk uh, cases? Well, in the Festival Rape at Glastonbury, what an excellent response. Over 100 calls, many citing that very distinctive green van. Um, also, lots of sightings, especially in the London area, of the man that we showed the artist's impression of. Fine. What about the uh, paintings that were stolen in that extraordinary raid in London, taking Gainsborough's and, and a Reynolds? Again, there was quite a good definition of a description of a man wanted for that. Yes, there's uh, a, a, an e-fit that we showed. We've had that, but of course anybody who sees it again and recognises him, please call us. One particular call that we're absolutely delighted about is that the lady who actually untied the warden has come forward, so we're very, very pleased. Thank you for her, to her for coming forward on that. It was a ghastly experience for a French student who was attacked on a train in South London, fled in terror and fell as she came out of the train onto the live current. Now, she survived, but horrible experience. What terrible, have you got on that one? Terrible attack. 50 calls here to the incident room and to the, the studio here on this one. From, a lot of them from people who travel in as commuters on the trains, um, perhaps have cited him in the past. Uh, we've had a lot of um, in detailed information which police want to work on, but uh, here's the impression again. Where is he now? If anybody knows, please call us. And on the Brian Adams murder? Very quickly, um, the incident room had one interesting call. If you rang the incident room giving information about a broken gun, please call back. Thank you. Sue? Well, Eric Knowles has been keeping abreast of calls to Aladdin's cave. What sort of things have been claimed? Well, there's a definite pointer towards a stately home for our punch bowl, um, Sue. But it's always the things, again, that people see off camera in the background. This, for example, this, this is a Japanese figure of a demon called an Oni. Um, but he's very similar to an Italian bronze of Silenus in the same posture. Another thing is this there I say, Sergeant Pepper. Now, this is an album that was uh, issued long before I was uh, given the key of the door. I'd like to stress that point. But it's an American object because it's Capitol Records. It's the American label. But it's an enigma because it, it's obviously a made-up job. Um, they never publish both the, the gold disc with yeah. the, the Sergeant Pepper single. So somebody might well recognise having done that specially. They might. But the ivory, uh, the ivory chess set, and I would like to stress that despite the fantastic workmanship in these objects, they were made in huge quantities. So take a good look at that, Chappie, because many of these were made. Incredible, though it may seem. Mm, so intricate. Eric, thank you. Well, we'll be back uh, a month from now. Meantime, let me remind you of that big international survey, which showed that though we worry a great deal about crime in Britain, we've far less to be concerned about than most other countries in the world. When it comes to assault, for example, we have the lowest rate of any nation sampled, except Switzerland. So don't have nightmares, do sleep well. Good night. Good night.